Hello and welcome to the Quiet Happiness Knits podcast. My name is Emily. You can find me on Instagram as Quiet Happiness Knits. And I'm coming to you from the woods behind my house in the beautiful state of Maine. It's a little bit buggy, so there will probably be some mosquito swatting during this recording. So yes, welcome. I hope that wherever you are, you're doing as well as you can in these bananas times. Um, today I'm going to talk about what I'm, I have one big finished object, I have two works in progress, and then I'm going to talk about packing some knitting for traveling. Now obviously most of us are not going places right now, not traveling, um, but uh, my sister is getting married up in New Brunswick, Canada, which is, um, she's about like a six, six and a half hour car ride away from where I live. Um, the original plan was for her to get married in Maine. She's been in Canada for school. It's where her fiance lives. Um, and so obviously plans change. So they will be getting married in Canada. My, some, uh, most of my family and I will be going up quarantining for two weeks, um, and then there will be the wedding, then we'll have a few days of, like, being able to have visiting with hugs and sitting in the same, like, sitting indoors, and then we'll come back home. So, yeah, <laughs> so that's, that is not the London trip my sister and I were originally planning for this year, but at least we get to go somewhere and have something to celebrate. It was a different sister I was going to go to London with, not the one who's going to get married. That would have been a lot for one year. So I t I'm going to talk about what projects I'm packing, what I'm planning on bringing with me, and also some of the issues with Ravelry and how um, and what I have been doing to find and buy patterns. So the first finished object I have, I don't think I've talked about this, because it's just one of those massive, never-ending things. But it is related to my sister's wedding. So I crocheted my sister, who's getting married, a blanket. It was a free pattern. Um, I'll have a link to the blog post in the description box down below. Um, it's not for a blanket. It would be. It would fit like, like a toddler blanket or so, or a toddler bed. Like it's not a, a bedspread. Um, just kind of a cozy, keep it on a couch or a chair kind of blanket. I still have a few ends to weave in. I wove in most of them. Um, back in the fall I had offered to make my sister something um, for her new house or for, um, for the wedding, for my gift to them. And she picked the colors, we kind of picked the pattern and the colors together so that I knew it would be something she really would like. So the yarn, I believe it's Knit Picks Brava Worsted. I think that's one of their bases that they have in multiple weights. It is a 100% acrylic yarn and I don't remember all the colorways I used, um, but she picked 
this gray and then like a like a blue with hints of teal and coral. I don't do a lot of knitting with acrylic yarn um, for a variety of reasons. I don't particularly like how most acrylic yarns feel. Um, there, I also think that there are some environmental issues with the production of acrylic, but obviously I just made a whole blanket out of it. So I think every kind of yarn has its uses. I also know that I am speaking from a privileged position of having enough flexible income to afford a more expensive wool yarn or other natural fibers instead of acrylic most of the time. Um, but I knit, that's mostly what I started out knitting with because it's what I saw, it's what I was available to me. Um, and I also tend to, I, I like to use it for things that I'm giving to other people. I either use acrylic yarns or superwash yarns because I just don't want there to be any sort of felting accidents. I don't want people to feel like they can't use the item because it's too precious or they don't know how to take care of it. So when I knit something for somebody else, I like to use a yarn that can be put in the washer, put in the dryer. And obviously, like anything, if it goes through the washer and the dryer enough, it's going to change shape or lose some color, but that's the way that all the clothes we wear work too. So yes, yeah, so I, it took me a while, but I also would like put it down for a couple months and then pick it back up. Um, but yeah, I found this really enjoyable. It was fun to kind of dust off my crochet skills. I learned some basic crochet when I was younger, but knitting was what really, I really took to. I think part of it is because I can knit without looking. Um, crocheting, I find that, and it's probably just because I haven't done it as much, but just by nature of it, you have to look where you're putting the hook in. And with knitting, especially if it's something easy, I can just do it without looking. Um, so that was part of my issue is that I had to be looking, especially to make sure I was counting the correct number of stitches um, for the zigzag pattern. But it was really fun to work on. Um, I finally, I finished it and obviously it's summertime, so it's warmer. So having a big heavy blanket on my lap was not ideal. But I basically, I would work on it like in the mornings before work, um, before it got hot. So I finished, I finished it up. My other, I will, so I have a couple of projects on the needles right now. I am still working on my Osmond shawl, which I talked about last time, but it still looks the same, just slightly larger. So I, I didn't bother bringing it outside. What I have started is a new pair of socks. I finished the Pebbles and Pathway socks that I talked about last time. Um, I didn't bring them out because they were practically done last time. I am knitting the, oh, now I'm gonna say it wrong. I am knitting the Toriel socks by Rachel Ramo. And it is a kind of shorty sock um, so this is, this is the heel, so it's got a few inches of knitting above the heel. And it's this really fun ribbed pattern that, um, that includes kind of these wedges of stockinette that grow out of the twisted rib. And it's going to be a similar patterning on the toe. I'm knitting these out of a Legacy Knits Fiber Arts, I said that wrong. <laughs> I'm knitting these out of a Legacy Fiber Arts yarn. I don't remember what the colorway is. I think it was just like fall sock set or something. And I had knit, and it came with a purple mini skein. So I had knit a pair of socks. Mm, I think they were, mm, I think they were the High Desert Socks by Lindsay of Lost and Fond. Um, and because so much of that sock uses the mini skein, I had a ton of yarn left over. I often have 30 to 40 grams of yarn left over from socks, sometimes even 50 grams. So I still had a ton of the yarn left over. So I thought they would be perfect for some slightly shorter socks. And I like that you can still see the ribbed texture, but the speckles are really fun in the stockinette stitch sections too. 
so yeah, I still have I still have quite a bit of the yarn left. So yeah, these are my current socks in progress. And, oh, and I talked last time, I talked a lot about um, the Addy Flexi Flips that I was using for the Pebbles and Pathway socks, and I, then I went back to my standard double pointed needles for these. I basically just like to rotate sock knitting methods. The other project that I have been working on is a sweater. I actually, I swatched for it the day after I recorded my last video, I swatched, blocked my swatch, and then measured it and cast on. I found I do a lot better with actually doing the full process of knitting a good size gauge swatch, blocking it, waiting a couple days for it to dry, and then measuring it. I do a lot better with that when I still have a bigger project on the needles, whether that's another top or a really big shawl or something because then it gives me a little bit more time to before I want to cast on the new project if I cast off if I'm casting off a lot of projects all at once which sometimes it just happens like that then I kind of get in that like oh no I really need to cast something on what if I go to this place and I need to have something to knit what if I sit down and watch a movie with my siblings and I need something to work on I don't have like and then you sometimes that ends to ends up in a panic cast on which I end up frogging other times it means that I don't do actually do a gauge swatch. Um, so I found I just need to be planning a little bit ahead when I'm halfway through my current sweater pro work in progress. I'll start thinking what sweater do I want to make, what do I have the yarn for, and then I can start that process of swatching and everything. So the sweater I cast on is the Boheme Pullover by Annie Lupton of Boho Chic Fiber Co. And I'm knitting this in on the round, her everyday fingering weight base in the garnet uh, colorway. And I bought, normally I would not make a full sweater out of indie dyed yarn unless it was like a short sleeved sweater that for my size only took two, maybe three skeins of yarn. But I purchased this in a Ravelry D stash so I was able to get a larger quantity for less money. Um, the seller was putting at a lower price point than what she had paid for it. So that's the only reason why I actually have a sweater's quantity of a fingering weight yarn. Um, <laughs> let me refrain. Wow, I cannot talk today. That is why, that's the only reason why I have a sweater's quantity of indie dyed yarn. There we go. So this, obviously, is not <laughs> not the front of the sweater. Um, this is a sleeve. I decided I would start with the sleeves, partly because I didn't think I would get this much knit before we started driving to Canada, so I thought it would be a good thing to work on in the car. Um, but then I absolutely loved working on it and got a lot more done than I thought I would. I also just like to do sleeves first because they're smaller. So at the beginning of a project, they seem to move along faster because they're not as big as the, the body, the front or the back piece or anything. Um, but for whatever reason, when, you, when I knit them at the end of the sweater, they just seem like they take an eternity to knit. So I decided I would start with the sleeves. And I realized it's been a while since I knit a sweater in pieces. So this is you knit the front, the back, the sleeves, seam it together. And it's been a while. It's been, a, I think it's at least been a year since I've knit a sweater in pieces like this. And what I've done, what I often do when I knit a sweater is I'll knit the sleeves two at a time. It just makes sure if I goof up the increases or like miscount how many rows I go between sleeve increases, I do the same on both. And again, to just keep it moving, get them both done at the same time. But for this, since it's indie dyed yarn, I am alternating skeins. And I was not about to try to deal with four balls of yarn, especially not if I'm going to be working on this in a van while driving. I'm not driving while riding. So yeah, so I'm, but it's moving along really quickly. And I think part of that is part of why I don't always like sleeves is if 
they're just stuck in that stitch forever. I get so bored. <laughs> but with these, it's a lace panel up the middle, and then it's a broken rib pattern on either side. And for the sweater, the front will have two of these lace panels in the center with a broken rib on either side, and the back is just this broken rib. So I am absolutely loving, loving this. And I even, I had to do, I placed an order with Newit Yarn Shop in Portland to get needles specifically for this. Um, because I just, I didn't have any good, like, size 5, I think these are size 5, no, size 3 knitting needles. I only had, like, really short, like, 24 inch circulars, and I did not feel like using those for a sweater. Um, and Knitwit is doing, they're doing, um, it's a really small shop anyway, so they're really limiting how many people can be in the store. You can set up an appointment, you can try to drop in, but you'll have to wait if somebody has an appointment. Or you can do, you can place an order online and either get it shipped to you, or you can do curbside pickup. So that's what I did. I had some other errands to run, so I went in and just stood outside, called them, and they brought it right out to me. So, okay, oh, I was going to talk more about my gauge swatch. So, I was, like I was saying, I was a good kid, did my swatch, washed it, let it dry, and I think the pattern gauge was something like 22 stitches to 4 inches, and mine was 27 stitches to 4 inches, which is a lot different. <laughs> um, but I really liked the fabric that I was getting, like it's still nice and drapey, but it has some texture. And something that I learned, I was, I was watching, um, I was watching something with Amy Herzog, and she was saying that a good test to do to see if your gauge, it will be tight enough for a sweater so that it's not going to do a lot of bagging and sa or sagging or pilling, is to do like a, to try to poke your finger through the stitches, and if you can push your finger through your knitting, then your gauge is probably too loose. At least for like a nice, for like, unless you're going for a super drapey oversized, obviously you can knit whatever you want at whatever gauge you want, but if you just wanted to keep its structure and like I said, not pill as easily, that's a good test to see how tight your gauge is. Um, and so I really liked the gauge I was getting with this, with this needle size and this yarn. So I just did some quick math, and I'm realizing I left my notebook where I wrote out the math inside. Um, so I basically calculated at the, um, I looked at the schematic to see how many inches around, I think it was, I used the bust measurement. It was um, at the size that gave me the, the ease I wanted. I think I'm a 38 inch bust, and so I think I was going to, I was originally planning on knitting the 42 inch size to give me four inches of positive ease. I think that's what it was. And so I calculated based on the gauge of 22 stitches per inch, I figured out how many stitches 42 inches would be. And then I calculated, so now I'm trying to remember how I did this. And then basically I took my gauge times that number of stitches to see how many inches I would get. Does that make sense? I don't remember exactly what it was, um, but I think it was something like to get to, at, at the pattern gauge, to get to a 42 inch bust, it would take something like 250 stitches. And then, but with my gauge, if I knit 250 stitches, I think I ended up with something like a 30, in the low 30s. I don't remember exactly what it was, but in the low 30 inches for the bust. Um, which was definitely not what I wanted. So then I basically just calculated once I had my stitches per inch with my gauge, I just calculated it on a few of the different sizes to see how many, um, basically to see how many stitches it would take me to get to a 42 inch bust. So I think, so I ended up casting on two or three sizes up. I'm knitting the size five in the pattern, 
which I believe is originally a either the 50 or the 52 inch bust size, which I normally would not look at a pattern and pick that size. But I was really glad that I'd done a gauge swatch because if I just cast on with the recommended needle size and knit the 42 inch bust size, it would have been way too small. So I am very glad I swatched for this so that it will actually fit me. And I knew I could take the risk of knitting it at a much tighter gauge because I was, I was already going to have, I think about a full, almost a full skein of yarn left over based on the yardage. So I think I'll be okay if, um, if I knit it at that bigger size. And it, it is a little bit harder to manage yardage in when you're knitting it pieces, like if you're knitting it top down, you're knitting the front and back at the same side at the same time, or if you're just knitting it in the round. Um, but I think basically with a long sleeve sweater that's in pieces, every you can, you can kind of divide your your, your um, the yarn required up into three. So typically the front of the sweater takes a third of your yarn, the back takes a third, and the two sleeves together take a third. So I can figure out, I, okay, I have five skeins of the yarn. If I divide that by three, that means that if I use, so if I use about a skein and a half of yarn for each section, I should be fine. It's something like 1.6 something, something, something skeins of yarn. It's what I can use for each of the, of those three sections um, to make sure I have enough yarn. And if it ends up being a little bit cropped or I need to frog the sleeves and knit them shorter, I think that'll be fine. And, and even with the sleeves, if I, um, I wouldn't necessarily frog them all the way down because you're doing a lot of sleeve increases in the first part of the sleeve and then just knitting straight back and forth until you get to the length requirement. And the sleeves are loose enough that if I if I needed to pull, to frog some of it to get some more yarn, I could just frog enough of it so that I would end up with a three quarter length sleeve. If that makes sense, I wouldn't need to fully rip out the entire sleeve because whatever whatever the fabric width would be here, um, it would be the same as it would be up here if I knit the full length. If that makes sense. So like if my sweater is 8 inches, if the sleeve is 8 inches around here and here, then if I frog this, I still have 8 inches up here. Because um, the sweater is nice and loose, so I have some positive ease to work with in, um, in my sleeve. That was a lot of <laughs> words about a sweater. But yes, yeah, so that is my Boheme sweater by Annie Lupton. So now I'm going to talk about the projects that I am um, bringing yarn for to, um, so that I have some extra projects in case I finish what I'm currently working on. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm going to bring all of those things that I'm working on right now, the socks, the sweater, my Osmond shawl. The Osmond shawl is a really nice mindless knit. It's mostly garter stitch. There will be a few sections where there's some color transition and doing a small amount of color work, but it's just a really nice mindless knit, which will be good for visiting. Um, the socks, the Toriel socks are pretty mindless right now. Uh, the sweater takes a little bit more work, so that's kind of my uh, mind absorbing project, which I hadn't realized I'd been wanting until I cast it on something that I actually had to focus on while I knit it was exactly what I needed. So I'm bringing all of those with me. Socks are really, if I only had to pick one kind of project to bring on a trip, it would be socks because they're small, so they're really easily portable. And also it doesn't take that much room to pack a couple of extra skeins of sock yarn in your bag in case you finish the socks you're working on which is 100% what I'm doing. So, especially since those are, those socks are, are relatively short. I am bringing these two skeins of Tuku Wool Sock, which is their 80% finished wool, 20% polyamide yarn. And I believe 
they are, yeah, so each skein is 50 grams. Um, so a typical skein of fingering weight or sock yarn is somewhere around 100 grams. So I am bringing these two skeins and I'm planning on knitting the Lawaro socks by Don Henderson. It's a pattern that came out, it's a Brooklyn Tweed pattern. Um, so I've never used Tuka wool before. This was very kindly given to me. So I'm excited to use a more, to, to use a more rustic wool for socks. I have knit socks with more rustic wool, but I guess recently I've been using a lot more, um, like your standard merino nylon fingering weight base for socks. So yeah, I'm excited to use this. It's definitely, I can feel that it's not a super wash. Um, so it is a little bit more toothy. Because I know rustic is sometimes like a catch-all word that we sometimes use as code for scratchy. Um, but I would say it's more of a toothy yarn, more so than like a West Yorkshire Spinners. Um, but less than just a 100% wool yarn would be. And it's a different breed. It is Finnish wool. And I've never used that before, so. And the, the Lawaro sock pattern is, um, it has some cables on the top and then like a small cable and some, just some like ribbing twisted stitches onto the foot of the sock. So I figure it's a dark enough color that the cables, even if it was in a very highly twisted yarn, wouldn't necessarily be super defined because of the dark color. So I'm not worried about whether or not the cables really show up super well because it is a dark color. Um, I think there's there, I think there's enough twist that the cables will still be well defined. It's just not as highly twisted as like the the yarn I'm using for my other socks. I'm also throwing in just a couple skeins I have lying around of Knit Picks Felici, their self-striping sock yarn, just in case I really need a vanilla sock. I'm ready. Gonna be ready for all the knitting. I'm gonna be up there for like two weeks and four, so like two and a half weeks. I need some options. So the last pattern that I am bringing yarn in case I finish another project and want to cast this on. Uh, so the other project I am planning is the Burst Into Bloom wrap by Tina Say. And I am bringing these two absolutely stunning skeins from Wild Star Fibers. Who is, I, rec I had only recently discovered her on Instagram and her yarns are absolutely beautiful. If you like really vivid or really saturated colors, definitely um, take a look at her shop. So this this purple is her Shooting Star Batch number 26 colorway. And this one, I'll include a picture of what this looked like in the skein so you can just get another look at what colors are in it. This is her Leviathan colorway. And both of these are her 85% superwash merino, 15% nylon base. So I had found her on Instagram and she was having a shop update. Um, so I went and I looked around and as soon as I saw this skein, I knew that this was the one that I wanted to get. But then I couldn't decide if I wanted to get two of these skeins and knit something with them together or pull something from stash to knit it with or find another one of her yarns. And then I found this purple yarn which just seemed to go perfectly because this skein doesn't have this dark purple in it except for some speckles but it does have a lighter purple. So I like a um, like a paler purple it's got some some lavender in it a little bit of pink speckles. See, even the bugs like it. I think my bug spray is wearing off. So, yes, yeah, so the Burst Into Bloom shawl is alternating solid color sections with a variegated yarn in, the, in some lace and some other stripes. So it was really fun to see a pattern that used a variegated yarn 
or a speckled yarn in the pattern sections. I haven't totally decided which one of these I want to use for those lacy sections, um, but I love these. <laughs> it took me a really long time to decide on a pattern to knit with these. I couldn't decide if I wanted to do something that was brioche or if I wanted something that was striped. I just couldn't decide. But Tina has a lot of really nice options for knitting with two or three different colors, uh, like two or three single skeins in some sort of shawl or wrap. And even her sweater patterns use a lot of striping to inc or other sort of color small bits of color work to you to incorporate two colors, which is perfect for some sort of like stash diving. Or it's really good if you have one skein of a really special indie dyed yarn that you, you can alternate it with um, with a different um, like a with a less expensive yarn. If um, like I I don't know if you remember my um, a couple videos ago I talked about the sweater I was knitting for my mom. It was a breathing space and I was knitting it out of Knit Picks palette, alternating with a hand spun yarn that was given to me. So that's a really good option to incorporate a special yarn and show it off while still having a more budget friendly overall pattern. So Tina's patterns are really good for that. And her Patreon is also amazing. If you're able to support her, she posts a little bit about her design process and some yarn collaborations she's doing, as well as just her really insightful thoughts. If you like her Instagram posts, picture that, but with more room to flesh it out highly recommend. But anyway, so that's what I'm planning on casting on with these. Either on the trip or sometime after we're back, but these will get knit soon. So that's all I have for things I'm working on and things I want to be working on. So I thought I would talk a little bit about um, what's been going on with Ravelry. If you're on Instagram, chances are you've probably seen um, seen a lot of this, a lot of this discussion happening, but in case you aren't, because I know not everybody is, um, Ravelry, I think about a month, just over a month ago now, released a new website design. It is very different from the old one, um, like the look of it. It is white, like the, pretty much everything is white, and then with some really high contrast for everything else for text. There's a lot of drop shadows. The login screen had things that were moving. I've, I haven't actually seen that because my computer just keeps me logged in, so I haven't seen the login screen. Um, but it was a combination of high contrast, drop shadows, moving objects, just to log in. And lots of people were reporting not being able to access the website because they were getting migraines. There are people who have had seizures just from looking at the website for a couple of minutes or even seconds. And the problem beyond that is that Ravelry has not really responded. They shut down posts in threads and in the forums about these issues. They've put out a couple of surveys but again, they're still in the new Ravelry format and they're not, they're not really seem to be wanting to fix anything, especially the more recent survey they did, which was more about which of these two options do you like better? Not, can you actually look, physically look at either of these options? There was no, neither of these options are good in the multiple choice. It was just pick one of these images. Um, and there has just been a complete lack of response from Ravelry social media, from the designers and the, the Ravelry team. And the thing is, is that they're still sending responses when people submit other bug reports for different problems, not related to the new design, but they're not responding to anyone trying to find out why they're not doing anything. If you're on Instagram, I believe her username is KT28, has been doing so much work 
in keeping this issue, keeping this, the discussion going, keep finding out new information, updating people um, in her Instagram stories. She's been doing a really good job and she's been sharing what people have messaged her about, their experience with the website and with the team. So I highly recommend you follow her on Instagram, if you're on Instagram, um, to get her updates. And I think one of the biggest things is just that so for so many people, Ravelry was their community. That's where they met other crafters. It's where they felt like they, it's where they had made friends. It's where they felt like they had a place to belong and they were welcomed. And now suddenly their Ravelry team just doesn't seem to care. They haven't even posted a wow, we're really sorry that this has been happening to you. We're getting, we're working to fix this as soon as we can. They're not going back to the old design until they can get these features improved. They're, they're just not responding. And so, so many people are just feeling so hurt by this that they cannot access their communities anymore. And there is technically, you can switch your Ravelry back to classic Ravelry, but even then it doesn't look exactly the same. People have still been reporting problems with migraines and things when they are using classic Ravelry and it still requires you to log in and navigate to that screen. And if you're somebody who gets migraines, that is, the, the steps to get there are too long. And even their emails, because designers had started saying, well, you can, like, like, send me an email if you cannot access Ravelry, and I will send you the pattern download, and you'll get an email from Ravelry. Or if you bought it on a, like, on their own website or something, if you gave them the Ravelry username, they would send it to you on Ravelry. But even at some point, the emails used to be in classic Ravelry, and at some point, I think it was just last week, they, even the emails switched over to using the new design and the new look. So even pattern emails are in the new design, which if a person has a reaction to the website design, they will also have a reaction to the emails. So it's, it's just so sad because none of this had to happen. So many websites work so hard to stay accessible for people and to have options so that you can change the website so that whatever disabilities or migraines or whatever problems that you are already really a pain to deal with and are not something anybody really wants to live with so that you can avoid the triggers if you go onto other websites there are easily accessible visibility options but Ravelry has not done that um, so that's kind of leaving a lot of people trying to figure out what do we do now? What do I use instead? Because Ravelry has really become the place where you discover new designs and new designers and you talk in forums with people and you can see other people's projects and you can comment on them. You, like there's so much that we use Ravelry for. Um, and now that's gone for so many people. And for me, I have not had any problems accessing the site, but I do not want to financially support them just because I can access the site because of how unresponsive they've been. But, I'm all, but I also know that a lot of smaller designers and people, whether it was a yarn dyer or someone who sold other knitting related things that would advertise on Instagram, or not on Instagram, on Ravelry, they've seen a decrease in revenue after the new design was launched. Um, so I don't want to, in a ripple effect, punish a designer or a yarn dyer because of Ravelry's choices. So for me, um, I pulled out a notebook and made my notes about my pullover and my gauge and everything in that notebook instead of logging it in a project page on Ravelry. Any patterns I have purchased, I have been finding a different source for them. So the Toriel socks, I purchased that pattern on Etsy. The Boheme sweater, I already had that pattern in my, 
I'd already purchased that on Ravelry like months ago. Um, the Burst into Bloom Wrap by Tina Say, I bought on her website. Um, it's just so hard because some people already had a website or already had another option. But a lot of people are, a lot of designers have now had to scramble to try to create another option. I know a lot of people have been using PayHip. I haven't personally used that one yet. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's so hard. But yeah, basically I am buying them on a separate website. And then I'm saving them to my Google Drive. It's what I used to do before I had discovered Ravelry as a knitter. Um, I would just save all my patterns to my Google Drive so, I could, and so that means I can access them on my computer or on my phone. Just download them. Um, it's definitely not perfect. And that's fine for now, but eventually when I want to look for a new sweater pattern, I'm going to want to have all of the search options where you can search by yardage and by size and by yarn weight and all of those features that make us love Ravelry, um, those features are not available on Etsy. And you can't, it's hard, you know, you can't just do a Google search for that kind of specific detail. So I'm kind of, I know that I still have accessibility, so I'm still like I logged on to download my Boheme PDF. Um, I can still log on to look at things that I favorited or things that I already have in my library, but I'm just really trying to only purchase, only do any financial transactions off-site to not buy anything on Ravelry itself. So yeah, I've just really been trying to find other sources, find other ways and I think this has shown that it is increasingly important to subscribe to people's newsletters or support them on Patreon or have some other way that you are getting updates from your favorite designers. Um, so then you can know when they release new patterns. And the sad thing is, is that this is mostly going to be affecting smaller designers. Like the really popular people in the industry are not going to be hurt as much by this because they their pattern sales are already so much higher they have a much bigger audience that's more likely to interact with them online in some way so they're able to still get out inf more information about their new patterns but for smaller designers who don't have as big a following maybe on instagram but if they one of their designs gets really popular in ravelry way more people they get way more people hear about them and follow them and buy their patterns so i it's just going to be so hard for smaller designers and for dyers who advertise on Ravelry um, for them to lose that income. But it's, it is what it is and we just kind of all have to figure out a way to interact with it, to keep talking about it like any like any problem where people are being excluded or discriminated against I do think it's important to keep the conversation going keep sharing things keep making posts commenting on things talking about things still letting Ravelry know even if they shut down forums that this is a problem that they need to address you know, if if you messed up and completely overwrote the old code so you can no longer go back to the old website tell us you know, like, there's just the complete lack of communication is what has just really been frustrating me and frustrating a lot of people. So, yeah. We like easy answers, and sometimes there are no easy answers. So, that's what, I, that's what I'm doing for now instead of buying patterns on Ravelry. I'd love to hear what you've been doing. I have been thinking of starting a spreadsheet to track my stash. Um, I haven't decided how important that is to me since I didn't always update my stash in Ravelry and when I did it was usually just because I was using that yarn in a project and wanted to link it on Ravel in my project page. Um, but I know there have been some of those going around um, of just different options 
you can, I'm sure you could create, or somebody has created like a, a PDF that you can print out and fill in with your pattern information if you wanted a template for that. Again, I'm just, I pulled out a notebook and I'm just making my notes in the notebook instead. So yeah, I'd love to know um, if you have found some alternatives to what you used to use Ravelry for. Um, I'd love to hear about it. I have another poem to read. I did, I asked on Instagram um, earlier this week for some uh, poetry suggestions, either specific poets or poetry collections. So I went on, so a few people answered with some fabulous poets and collections. So I did go and buy a few of those used on thrift books and I ordered a few for my library that I'm hoping will come in before uh, we leave for Canada. So I'm trying try to read more poetry. So I have a poem to read to you today. So let's take a deep breath. This poem is called, What Kind of Times Are These? by Adrian Rich. There's a place between two stands of trees where the grass grows uphill, and the old revolutionary road breaks off into shadows near a meeting house abandoned by the persecuted who disappeared into those shadows. I've walked there picking mushrooms at the edge of dread, but don't be fooled. This isn't a Russian poem. This is not somewhere else but here. Our country moving closer to its own truth and dread, its own ways of making people disappear. I won't tell you where this place is, the dark mesh of woods meeting the unmarked strip of light, ghost-ridden crossroads, leaf-mold paradise. I know already who wants to buy it, sell it, make it disappear. And I won't tell you where it is, so why do I tell you anything? Because you still listen. Because in times like these, to have you listen at all, it's necessary to talk about the trees. So I hope that you enjoyed my ramblings about knitting and Ravelry and the poem. And I hope that wherever you are, where, whatever you're doing, that you find some time to create and maybe join me in trying to read a little poetry. So until I see you next time, goodbye from me. Tomorrow I will feel much better. Tomorrow I will start anew. Tomorrow is a shining prospect.